Hello, everyone. I'm Leslie Friday. I am the Director of Content with the Marketing and Communications team. And we're just going to wait a couple seconds here as people are dialing in. I know we had many RSVPs, so uh, we'll just have a couple seconds here to uh, let everybody get online too with us. All right. Uh, again, I'm Leslie Friday. I'm the Director of Content with Partners in Health. Uh, welcome to a PIH webinar series, and today we're talking about COVID-19 response in Navajo Nation. And I uh, have the great opportunity to be sitting here virtually with Hannah Sen, with Dr. Jenny Wei, and with Dr. Mia Lozada, and soon we'll be joined by Dr. Sonia Shin. Uh, and so I will introduce everybody here uh, in just a moment. I want to walk through some of the basics to how you can best enjoy this Zoom webinar with us. Uh, so if you go up to the top here of your screen, you'll see that there are some view options. If you click on that, the side-by-side -side mode is uh, one of the easiest ways to watch the presentation. And then if you uh, move your cursor over to the right, you'll see these double parallel lines. You can move them back and forth if you're having a hard time reading the slides perfectly. Uh, we will be sharing a full recording of this afterwards. So if you know uh, that uh, anyone wanted to watch this but couldn't dial in uh, at this time, that will be available afterwards, as well as all the slides that are going to be shared today. So don't feel like you have to take uh, crazy notes. You will be able to access this later. So um, without further ado, I want to announce all of our wonderful panelists. Um, and just a note to uh, Hannah Sen, who is our um, Interim Executive Director for COPE, and COPE is our partner uh, in Navajo Nation, and it stands for Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment. So Hannah Sen um, will not be on video today because the actually the internet access is not strong enough to be able to accommodate video at this time, but welcome Hannah. Uh, we also have Dr. Jenny Wei and Dr. Mia Lozada, and they are uh, both internal medicine physicians at Gallup uh, Indian Medical Center and assistant clinical professors at uh, UCSF. And we also have Dr. Sonia Shin, uh, who has joined us and she'll join us for the Q&A section here. Um, she is a Harvard Medical School Associate Professor and is also the Director of Research at COPE. So thank you to each of you for, for joining us. And um, I will hand off the presentation first to Hannah and then she'll hand over to uh, Jenny and Mia for the continued discussion. We'll also have a Q&A at the end. So definitely prepare your questions. Feel free to, to share them in the chat. So Hannah, uh, go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you, Leslie. So thank you everyone for taking the time out to join us today. I wanted to start by just providing a brief introduction of our organization, Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment, and then to also just spend a few minutes talking through the partnership and collaboration that we have with our partners across Navajo Nation. And then Dr. Wei and Dr. Lozada will be able to kind of go into more depth and detail around some of that um, deep collaboration that we have. So we're very excited. So just to mention a little bit um, how COPE came about. So COPE started formally in um, 2010 on Navajo Nation. And um, in that time, we worked very closely with the Navajo Area Indian Health Service and the Navajo Nation Department of Health with the Navajo Nation Community Health Representative Program. So we started in that collaboration with partners such as CHRs, public health nurses, providers at the health facilities, and really received their thoughts and feedback as well as community members on what are the things that would be you know, beneficial and how we're working together on Navajo Nation. And our two very strong supports and sister organizations, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and of course, Partners in Health, have been very key to all the work that we've been doing in collaboration with our partners here over the past 10 years. And so 
really wanted to start with this slide because nothing that we do within COPE would be possible without the strong partnerships that we have. And as you'll see as we go through the rest of the slides as well, everything that we're collaborating on with respect to COVID-19 also would never be possible without these very strong partnerships and that guidance that we receive from community members and our partners to really understand what the best role is for our partnership and collaboration. Next slide, please. So the first thing that I just wanted to spend a little time on, and I'm sure that a lot of individuals have heard about this already, but just to recognize the amazing work that Navajo Nation has been doing to respond to COVID-19. So early on, before the US had even declared a public health emergency, President Nez declared a public health emergency and actually was very quick to put into place measures that would help to contain the spread of COVID-19. But then across all of the partnerships that we have, so across the health facilities and especially the Navajo Nation community health representatives really mounted a very strong response to provide that support in the community and to really think about what would be vital to addressing COVID-19. And with that also have been all of the community members that have really stepped up, raising awareness, you know, being activists and really community protectors. And part of that has also been being able to ensure that the mitigation of COVID-19 um, is happening as well. So the community part, the role that community members have played has been so, so important. So I wanted to mention that just starting out because I think Navajo Nation has been very, very proactive and all of the partners as well. Next slide, please. So some of the areas that we've partnered with across COVID-19 activities include areas where we've received feedback that you know these are areas of need or there's a gap and then we've really been thoughtful about how can we work with our partners to be able to address you know some of these needs that have arisen so these are some of the different areas that we do collaborate in and we're only able to do this because of those partnerships so from you know being able to help with medical supplies for some of our local partners or the community support, being able to help with food or masks or gloves, et cetera. That is really possible because of a strong collaboration we have with many different entities and organizations that are helping to provide support to Navajo Nation. And so we're able to work together in that. And then with that, we've also been able to, we've worked for quite some time with the small stores across Navajo Nation and our Healthy Navajo Stores initiative. And so that's really provided us with the opportunity to be able to continue to support those small stores during this time with some of the items that they've indicated that would be helpful for them to stay healthy, as well as the individuals that are coming to their business. And then We've also been able to collaborate locally with providing support and outreach for individuals that are unsheltered. And um, Jenny and Mia will go into more detail around some of that work as well. And then we've also been able to work really closely with the health facilities and the Navajo Area Indian Health Service to help to provide support for volunteer medical personnel who are helping at health facilities across Navajo Nation. And then also have been requested to provide support around contact tracing and case management with a technology platform called ComCare, which I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And then also have worked closely with partners to be able to develop some educational materials. So this has included videos. So for example, our store outreach coordinator did a video for the stores on how employees can stay healthy and what are the things that are important for them to consider. And we're also working with some of our local partners on some other additional videos. And we've really tried to make sure that as we're developing these materials, we're 
filling the gap that's there, you know, versus duplicating, because there's a lot of amazing materials that the Navajo Department of Health has um, worked on and created early on that then we were able to actually just share with the stores and um, some of our other partners. Next slide. So one of the really strong responses to COVID-19 has been through the Navajo Unified Command. And within that is a case management team. And so it's a collaboration, of course, with Navajo Area Indian Health Service and the Navajo Nation Department of Health. And under that Unified Command structure is where contact tracing and case management um, for contact tracing, including case investigation, fall. And so some of the key components of that strategy, which has been really, really important here on Navajo Nation, has included expanded testing. So making sure that close contacts are able to be tested and there's really a strategic focus on any emerging hotspots or clusters. And then ensuring that of course, contact tracing is taking place and also that with that home support, so ensuring that individuals have the resources they need to be able to isolate or quarantine, that they're able to have those resources. And then the other area is around safe isolation. So ensuring that there's alternate places for individuals to isolate if maybe they're not able to safely isolate where they live at home. And so um, Dr. Lozada and Dr. Wei will talk a bit more about some of the respiratory shelters and the work within that area. But I think it's really amazing how Navajo Nation Unified Command has organized these pillars because it really ensures that it's a very proactive approach and that there's support for individuals that may actually need it. Next slide, please. So I think, you know, the other thing just to mention as well, I mentioned, you know, the CHRs and the work that they do, and they really have been on the front lines since the beginning of this work. And um, I think what we've really seen from everything that they've been doing as well is just how innovative and creative some of these approaches have been and really thinking about you know, what are the ways to support community members? What are the ways to raise awareness? And how can we ensure that we're really listening to the community, listening to CHRs, listening to partners to understand how we can best do that? Next slide. So with respect to contact tracing, um, the health facilities across Navajo Nation have really been doing a phenomenal job working on contact tracing and within um, the incident command structure, the lead for contact tracing, so the expanded workforce is Dr. Sonia Shin, who is on this call. And part of the work that we've been doing within that team is actually helping to expand the workforce that can support contact tracing across Navajo Nation, but doing that in a very coordinated effort that's guided by incident command and really trying to ensure that we're having you know, very clear SOPs and guides and being able to do workforce projections. And then also part of that contact tracing has been a tailored technology platform as well as the volunteer contact tracers themselves. So we've really you know, learned a lot from our partners that have been doing this work. So all of the health facilities across Navajo Nation that have been working on this over the past several months. And we've been able to learn from that feedback to be able to provide that support under the direction and leadership of Navajo Nation and Navajo Area Indian Health Service. Next slide, please. So this, um, I love this slide because we have an amazing team that has been working really closely, of course, with um, the PIH 
um, public health accompaniment team around COVID that has been working to expand the workforce of contact tracers. And I love this picture because it just really shows like what that training looks like now that we're in a virtual space and also just kind of gives a sense of all of the different individuals that have been participating in these trainings. So we've tried to be very strategic about how this program has been developed to ensure that local Diné students are able to be part of this program. And we know that they will, you know, have a, a really good sense of the community and also understand the health system, but that this can also be an opportunity for their own professional development and to be closer connected to the health facilities and to CHRs and public health nurses, especially if it might be an area where in the future, maybe they are interested in those public health or other health careers. And so the team that's been leading this, of course, is under um, Sonia Shen. And some of the ways that they've been able to provide this training has included virtual, but then has included a lot of just coaching and one-on-ones. And then we've been working with one of the health facilities to incorporate these contact tracers as part of the team. Next slide. So I just wanted to take a minute just to touch a little bit on the ComCare COVID-19 system that we are using um, across Navajo Nation. And again, this is under the leadership of the Navajo Epidemiology Center. So um, we work very closely with them under their leadership to be able to collaborate with the health facilities in using this platform for contact tracing, case investigation, and follow-up. And it's been really beneficial to learn from the sites that have been working on contact tracing early on because they have a lot of just rich feedback on how to design the system so that it can work very specifically for Navajo Nation. So it can help with all of those four pillars that I mentioned early on. And so that it can actually help to facilitate case management and then also facilitate the collection of information that is needed by the Navajo Epidemiology Center so that they can be able to make those recommendations around resources, around reopening, around gating criteria. And so we really see this as an opportunity to be able to actually strengthen that data sovereignty because this information is going to the Navajo Epidemiology Center. And they've been doing a phenomenal job in really being able to share information with community members. So some of the updates that have been included in this are things that are really trying to tailor it to what the workflow looks like for Navajo Nation so that we can ensure, you know, as mentioned early on, individuals that might need to isolate or quarantine have the resources and the support they need. And so that the sites are able to actually be able to see their own data and, you know, their reporting. And then also enable that virtual workforce to be able to be connected with those teams that are doing the contact tracing. So this is another area that we're collaborating on. And um, we've been just very, very honored to be working closely with all of our partners across Navajo Nation, really getting to, to learn from them. So with that, I'll um, turn it over to Jenny and Mia. Thank you. Ahiaha. All right, thank you so much, Hannah. Um, we've loved working with COPE and, and this next presentation hopefully will highlight uh, our strong relationship with one another and how we are so dependent on the work that COPE has done. So um, I'm Mia Lozada and Jenny and I both trained at, in internal medicine at UCSF and after our chief year, we moved out to work at the Gallup Indian Medical Center, uh, an Indian health service facility back in 2012. And pre-COVID we spent our, our time split in, as primary care providers and inpatient hospitalists, including ICU care here, with a particular focus on addiction medicine and transi transitions of care. And it was because of these interests that drew us toward working for caring for this vulnerable population, which we're going to talk about today, the persons experiencing homelessness here in the Gallup community. And so we're excited to share our experiences um, from here at Gallup India Medical Center with you today. Next slide. 
So we'll talk about some of the unique characteristics of Gallup, New Mexico and the social and medical environment here, as well as demonstrating a novel way to care for unsheltered individuals who have a history of substance use disorder. And then we'll also discuss um, how long-standing multi-agency collaboration uh, facilitated efficient and innovative COVID-19 response here in our area in this rural Indian Health Service location. Next slide. So for those who may not be familiar with Gallup, New Mexico, uh, we are located in the Four Corners region, as you can see here, um, with Navajo Nation spanning the three of the four Four Corners states, not going into Colorado. That red circle is where Gallup itself is, where we're technically off the Navajo reservation, um, although the area, the city of Gallup, actually has a lot of what we call checkerboard. So our city itself frequently switches between reservation and not reservation land. So as a border town, Gallup, New Mexico, we're about 25 miles from the Arizona border and we have a town of about 20,000 residents. Although on weekends and special events, that population can surge to about 100,000 individuals as folks come into town, this being the largest city for many individuals on the reservation for resources, grocery shopping and other things. The demographics of our, our county, where we sit within McKinley County, are about 80% Native American with 14% Latinx and 8% white. Um, those living in poverty are about a third um, within our county. Next slide. And this is Gallup Indian Medical Center. So GIMC, as we call it, was opened in 1961, soon after the Indian Health Service itself was founded, which was founded in 1955. Our inpatient facility has, in theory, the physical capacity for 99 beds, but we are frequently understaffed from the nursing and provider perspective, and so are, are really not able to sustain that number of inpatient um, stays for our um, population. But we do have about almost 6,000 and um, inpatient admissions per year. Our emergency department acts almost like a, an urban emergency department in a rural setting with about 40,000 visits per year. And we're one of the only tra trauma centers of all IHS facilities in the country. We're technically a level three trauma center. And we have many specialties here, um, in, in internal medicine, family medicine, general surgery, pediatrics, uh, but we really lack nearly every subspecialty. And so much of what drew Jenny and I to a career out here um, with the Indian Health Service was our ability to become both the generalist as general internists and the specialist for our patients, since the closest subspecialists are over 130 miles away. Next slide. So this is what it looked like. So the prior photo was pre-COVID and this is post-COVID uh, in terms of, of the changes that we had to make, um, which are very similar to many changes that have happened across the country in other hospital settings. So we, um, our hospital prepped very well. We retrofitted our spaces and we got PPE and felt very prepared. And our facility were early adopters of some of the best practices that were emerging at that time from Seattle um, and the New York City area with many of our emergency room providers having come from those areas and having connections there to, to learn directly from those who were at the front lines at that time. So we really tried to stay ahead of the curve. Um, and you can see in the next photo what our emergency room, next slide please, what our emergency room looked like before and then next slide how we converted it very quickly. This was actually happening in, the, in um, March um, and April, so early on in the pandemic. And New Mexico adopted early social distancing policies um, and it overall felt really calm. So we had made these dramatic changes and we began to wonder if we had actually overestimated the likelihood of an outbreak in Gallup, um, if, if only that had been true. So next slide. And the next slide. So you, you never want to be at the top of these New York Times lists and sadly Gallup has been persistently at the top throughout much of May and June with the, the image on the left showing new deaths in the last two weeks with Gallup, New Mexico, our small town being the highest in terms of per capita death rates. And on the right, um, just, you know, a few weeks ago being the hardest hit above, you know, all these other areas that have been discussed, um, New York City being listed seventh there. So Gallup, New Mexico, top, top of the list. Um, so what happened between April um, and June to create this shocking surge? So Jenny will take over and explain the unique characteristics of our community that has set up, that, that set us up to become one of the hardest hit areas in the country. 
Thank you. All right, so thank you. All right, so I think it's challenging to talk about why our community was hit so hard without providing just a little bit of a background in terms of our state and the county that we work in. So um, allow me to just take a couple slides to talk about that. So unfortunately, over for over two decades now, New Mexico has had the highest alcohol-related alcohol deaths of any state in the US. You can see on average, it's about 28 deaths per 100,000. And unfortunately, New Mexico, again, at the top of the list, um, not a, not, Another thing you don't wanna be at the top of um, at 51 per 100,000. Next slide. If you look at New Mexico in particular, broken down by county, McKinley County is where we, uh, is where our, is where Gallup New Mexico is located and where our Gallup service unit is located. Unfortunately, um, in McKinley County, we have had the highest death rates among all counties in New Mexico for the last six years at 166 per 100,000. And then uh, even more so American Indians and Alaska Natives bore the highest burden of alcohol related deaths at 170 per 100,000. Again, recalling that the national average is about 28 per 100,000. So I think with our limited resources, as mentioned already, we were really worried that we were going to get hit hard early on. And if we were going to get hit, we were going to really have a big burden of disease. Um, our emergency departments were going to be overburdened. The shelters and our detox facilities in town were going to be overburdened uh, because of needing to social distance, et cetera. And so we really wanted to plan very quickly early on. We were also worried knowing that many of our families live multi-generationally, sometimes dozens and even more so living all together in one household. So we knew that we would need to have a place for people who were positive or who had symptoms be able to separately isolate from others. It's also important to recall that um, because of the high rates of alcohol related disease that we have in New Mexico, we do have an, an, something called the New Mexico Detox, uh, Detox, Detoxification Reform Act, which allows us to pick people up off the streets under protective custody who are intoxicated and brought to a detox or sobering center to be held for 12 to 72 hours. Pre-COVID, January and February, um, you know, and pretty much uh, every month prior to COVID, we were holding upwards of 80 to 100 people in our detox facility. And so this was something we were really, really worried about as we were gonna have to decrease capacity and should it have to shut down, what would happen with some of these patients? So next slide. Early in March, we really started meeting and working very regular, working uh, closely with multiple agencies across the city, the county, the state, community volunteer organizations, including COPE, to try to figure out what we could do to possibly accommodate um, needing, needing to isolate us, many of our patients, should we get hit with COVID. Um, we thought about all possibilities. We thought about maybe using recreation centers, using schools, using gyms, using churches, um, thinking about outdoor tents, putting up an outdoor tent right outside the hospital in the parking lot and bringing in portable latrines and portable tents and portable heating sources. Ultimately, um, around that same time, what we were, you know, what we were envisioning was what we need are multiple small units and, and buildings and areas for people to individually be able to isolate. And of course, we started thinking a lot about all the hotels in town that were sadly not taking in as much of as many um, tourists coming from across the country. So around that same time, that very weekend, it was the weekend right after we had our very first case in McKinley County on um, right after March 18th, which was our very first case here, Mia got an, a call from the emergency department saying that one of her patients had come in with symptoms and had gotten tested for COVID, but couldn't go back to the shelter setting because he was symptomatic. And so we were trying to figure out what to do with this patient. He didn't need to be admitted to the hospital where our beds were already pretty much at full capacity. So we thought to just put together some money to get him a hotel room for the night. And we started talking to a bunch of our friends from the rest of the city and saying, hey, let's just put together a bunch of, uh, a bunch of money for donations to be able to you know, pay for some rooms for a few people. I mean, how many rooms would we need? And it would only be for a few weeks, right? So um, we started kind of thinking about that. And around that same time, we worked really closely with um, the Department of Health and they were actually able to provide us some more funding as well. Next slide. Our next click. So you can see we started to do a lot of pandemic planning around March 10th. Next, on March 18th, you can see we had our very first case of COVID positivity, a uh, COVID positive case at Gallup Indian Medical Center and really at, in McKinley County as a whole. Next, 
And then you can see on March 24th, so in the early month, in the early weeks of March, we were able to establish our very first isolation shelter program at El Rancho, um, which is our, our near, near and dear to our hearts. El Rancho was the very first hotel isolation site in all of New Mexico um, to start up a, a program like this. Next slide. Unfortunately, as we anticipated and as we were extremely worried about, there was an outbreak uh, around April 6th at the, at the detox facility in town. Before then, the last couple weeks, there were maybe about 10 or 12 cases of COVID um, and really only a few folks needing the hotel isolation sites. When we had our first case at the detox center, we found that he had spent the three of the last seven nights at the detox center and unfortunately had exposed about 170 people um, in those times. We did, we really, really tried to find those folks. And um, if you look at the, num the positivity rates for those patients, over 75% of those patients tested positive for, for COVID. The average rate that we have right now in, in um, our service unit is about 19% positivity rate. So you can see 75% is high by any stretch in any, even considering any congregate shelter setting, even considering prisons, et cetera. It is a really, really high rate uh, that we were very, very worried about. Luckily, we were able to really expand the hotel program very quickly. Over the course of the next few weeks, we got three more hotels in, um, on board uh, next. And you can see we were able to actually uh, increase to, on average from mid-April through mid-May, we actually had over 140, 150, even up to 160 patients in our hotel program um, daily, taking daily uh, checking in with patients. And Next, you can see, you know, the, the goal of the hotel program, as you can imagine, is really to provide anything that a patient may need in order to be able to safely isolate and stay in their rooms in order to kind of be away from others or be away from their family, et cetera, but still have all the needs met so that they wouldn't feel the need to leave um, and, and have their needs met elsewhere. Of course, we provided lodging and three meals a day. We provided transport back and forth from the hospital or whether they needed to come back for emergency um, issues or uh, appointments. And I will say the absolute backbone of the program, of our hotel program has been COPE, um, has been the collaboration that we've already, and through relationships we've already had with Hannah and Sonia at the time and through relationships we've already had with COPE, we were able to get many of these things set up very quickly. They jumped right on board. They took, they were able to essentially donate thousands of hours of their time to staff 24 seven our hotline to help triage the needs of the patients, whether that's social needs, whether that's needing uh, snacks, needing feminine hygiene products, needing toiletries, needing puzzles, books, radios, uh, refrigerators, all of those things and more. COPE has been so creative in providing for our patients. And then they also, of course, help us with medical triage if there's anything that uh, particularly um, that should be directed to for medical oversight. We kind of joke that we've tried to set up a patient-centered medical home in each of the hotels now. So Days In, Howard Johnson, Comfort Inn, each have their own specific team, uh, teamlet, of doctors and nurses and providers that check in with them daily to make sure that they're doing okay, not only to meet their acute COVID needs, to make sure that their respiratory symptoms are, are stable, um, or if not, that they get the immediate attention that they need, um, but also really to address a lot of their chronic issues, which you can imagine if people need to be in isolation or quarantine with us for over 10, 14, sometimes even longer, uh, we've, we really need to make sure that uh, we get their diabetes under control as well, or get them to dialysis, or get their wound care needs met, or um, a, a host of other things. Every day is exciting and every day is new in the hotel motel program. The other thing we are very aware of is that for people who were struggling with substance use disorders and anxiety and depression, being in a hotel room completely isolated all by themselves away from their positive um, and, and healthy coping mechanisms, we knew that was gonna be a challenge for many of our patients. So similarly, because of some of our connections that we already had with the Office of Peer Recovery Engagement, we were able to get certified peer support workers on board quickly to help. And every single patient that comes into our program gets a phone call from a peer support worker to see if they wanna to continue to check in with them. We have chaplains that came on board. We have Navajo interpreters. We found that 25% of our patients prefer 
Navajo as a primary language, so we've been able to make sure that we have the interpreters available. And Native Medicine, we've been so lucky that our Office of Native Medicine has been willing to actually um, provide and bless Native herbs. So this is actually a sagebrush. I wish you guys could smell this because it smells amazing. Um, and they provided some directions for patients on how to use it as a tea to be able to help to clear um, and um, heal from congestion, flu-like symptoms. And we just threw COVID in there as another indication for sagebrush. Um, and so it's been amazing. I've had patients literally crying, um, being so thankful that they had these native medicine herbs available as well because it typically is so expensive and to have it be blessed by a medicine man is, is something truly extraordinary. So, um, and then finally, we got a donation of 70 iPads for our program. So we've been really working to try to ramp up that program to get telemedicine going, whether it's group sessions and talking circles that we've already started over the last few weeks, and then trying to ramp up to do group sessions like for diabetes, um, healthy eating, things like that, while patients are a captive audience and um, really open and, and to thinking more about their health at this time. So next, since um, March 24th, when we opened, we've had over 800 patients in our program. And we've had over 30 non Gallup Indian Medical Center volunteers, providers helping from all across the country, donating over 3,600 hours to the program to help to be that provider or to be the scribe or to be the caller to check, to check in with patients. And they've come from all over the country. We've had a lot of people from the Uni University of California, San Francisco, where we already have a program established with them for our Global Health Fellowship. We have folks from COVID Care Force our Medical Reserve Corps from New Mexico, and really a smattering of people from all over the country. And um, it's it's been incredible to see we've even, and we had over 50 volunteers from our hospital um, alone as well. P speech pathologists, you know, um, uh, pediatric nurse, uh, everybody, even, we even had a retired uh, internal medicine doctor come back out of retirement to help us do some phone calls. So no doubt, um, you know, that these programs have helped to decrease transmission of COVID-19. We, we certainly hope and we've seen that with the flattening of our curve in Gallup where we peaked around late April, early May with about 50 to 60 cases per day. And we're now down and have plateaued about 10 to 15 cases per day over the last few weeks. And um, we know that part of it was the program of being able to isolate people um, in separate rooms. But we've not only been able to address people's acute medical issues as I talked about, but we really, have been able to connect people to the healthcare in general and to engaging people um, in in their healthcare. And for the first time in many years, people have told us that they've been this is the longest that they've ever been sober. Um, we've been able to connect people back with family, uh, connect them back to their to their homes, and we've we've been able to uh, get people you know to the point where we've been able to reach them to get them uh, their lab work to get them set up for rehab. We've had over 15 people um, check into inpatient uh, substance use rehab centers for, across all of New Mexico and Arizona. And while in the hotel program, we know that they've had significantly decreased emergency department visits. Um, they've had decreased run-ins with the law. They've had decreased need to be picked up by police and to be brought to the detox facilities. So we're seeing that housing first works, you know, that, um, that that providing housing and basic necessities allows people to then start to work towards their goals, their personal goals, and provide positive contributions to society. Um, that um, it's not housing first is not only the right thing to be doing for our patients, um, and not only what contributed significantly to the challenges that we had here in Gallup, but it also it makes sense from a cost perspective that it really does decrease very precious and, uh, and limited resources that we have in our community. So we have been so incredibly moved um, and heartened by everybody on this call. I know that there, the COPE has been an absolute backbone. I can't emphasize that enough um, to the program. If they weren't here, we wouldn't be able to, to continue the program like we have. Next slide. These are just some other pictures of the program. Um, so this is another, this is a picture of me uh, at the Howard Johnson, um, just waving at one of our patients who we've, we've just seen incredible talent from our patients that um, perhaps, uh, unfortunately, being in the hospital, I often don't get to see, but being able to round on the, in the hotels and seeing people doing well, housed, taking their medications, it's, it's, it's absolutely been incredible. Next slide. You can see this is a specific picture um, that one of our patients drew for one of our visiting uh, doctors um, to, to send home, ahiehe, uh, meaning thank you in Navajo. 
And finally, I just wanted to end with uh, a letter that one of our patients wrote to us um, who was in the program. He says, my name is blank and I'm writing to you, not just for myself, for others also. Thank you, uh, thanking you and your first responders. They are doing a great job checking, in, uh, checking our temperature and any other medical conditions we have. I've been put in this motel room by myself. At first I thought it was okay. And then I wanted to leave because I have an addiction problem. And some of your first responders helped me, have helped me by talking to me, setting me up with a treatment center, or I should say a healing center and get rid of my addiction. I'm healing from this poison and other poisons. I just wanted to say uh, thank you. So this is the letter that he wrote to us right before he went into rehab. Um, so again, we, Although the COVID has been such a horrible time for many of our community and many of our patients, our colleagues, I don't think anybody has um, not been hit by COVID or not known someone close to them who's passed away from COVID. Um, it, despite that horribleness, it's been incredible to see the community come together from every single corner of our, from our city, from our county, and from, from the rest of the from the rest of the country it's amazing that so many people who don't know our community at all but are willing to um, sacrifice their health and sacrifice their time away from their family to help ours and our community and i will forever be indebted to people that are um that are just so so willing to help us and so to, to take care of our most vulnerable population so thank you for this opportunity to talk to you guys and um and um Thank you for all the contributions that you guys have provided, COPE and PIH. I put this slide up as just as just a snapshot of the people that we've been able to collaborate with, um, many from existing collaborations from prior work that we've done. Um, and uh, this looks like an intimidating slide to think that we, you would have to coordinate with all of these organizations, but really realizing that it's just one individual person at each of these places that we knew that's an, that's an individual relationship, like knowing Hannah and knowing Sonia um, that, that got the, the partnerships together. So thank you guys. Thank you, Hannah and Jenny and Mia. This is really a wonderful presentation and I know uh, many people have enjoyed it. I've learned quite a bit. Um, so I wanna jump into questions here because we have a number of them that uh, were, were given uh, beforehand and also more streaming in. So let's jump in there and I'll just um, say someone's name who I think might be best to answer. Um, and Sonia, Dr. Sonia Shin, I wanna have you enter the conversation too. Maybe I'll send you the first question here. Um, since you uh, were mentioned quite a few times in connection with contact tracing, you know, in, in general, could you speak to how is testing and contact tracing, how widespread is it across the Navajo Nation uh, from your perspective? Yeah, sure. So thank you for um, inviting me to um, visit with all of you for a little bit. And it's uh, just been great to listen to the, um, the previous presenters. So um, I'd say, first of all, testing has been ahead of the curve. So if you compare uh, the access to testing um, uh, within Navajo Nation uh, to the United States. I think generally we've been quite successful in rolling out testing uh, pretty aggressively. There are times when it is, you know, challenging. Um, there are times when the turnaround time is a little bit slower, but um, for instance, in Phoenix, where um, <clears throat> I think right now for, with a, you know, kind of the surge that's happening, um, people being turned away, I, I have not heard of those kinds of challenges here on Navajo. For contact tracing, um, you know, it's probably like so many other places where all of a sudden, you know, COVID just arrived and people um, built whatever structures and teams that they could assemble to carry out contact tracing. And now that we have, you know, um, a little bit more, um, you know, sort of space and, and time to think about these things, what we're really trying to do is take these kinds of um, this kind of mosaic of, of teams at the sites, um, the states, et cetera, and actually try to work to create more of a coordinated system with the long view in mind. Uh, so I think that contact tracing, everybody's getting contact traced. You know, I think that um, it's going well. The challenge is really making sure that um, the, it's all happening in a coordinated system as Hannah alluded to, that we're all actually able to see that data in a way that we can make um, um, uh, decisions in real time. And ideally, you know, I think um, 
we're just starting to see uh, how much more effective it is to be contact tracing from your local hospital because then you can immediately connect um, you know for instance last night there was a woman out in the community who had chest pain and um, the caller was able to you know get that person to come into the emergency room and get evaluated and have them admitted into the respiratory shelter you know under uh, um, you know uh, the system that Jenny and me are describing so you know if we're really connected as a care team as opposed to just a kind of a pub, like a contact tracing team I think uh, just the the support that we're able to give the families is stronger Good. that's great thank you Sonia uh, I also want to ask a question of, that many people are, are asking, frankly, about, you know, how can they help and are any resources needed? Uh, many people, you know, have heard that PPE, for example, is in short supply in some places across the nation. Uh, so maybe this would be a good question for Jenny and, and Mia to respond to. Uh, how, what does it look like where you're sitting? Yeah, I think that's definitely something, you know, very early on we were worried about. We did have to go into like contingency and crisis mode per the CDC. They did really lay out uh, based on your supply and demand and anticipated uh, future needs, what types of things you need to do. So unfortunately, we were needing to reuse PPE at times. Um, we were needing to, you know, do use reusable um, uh, face shields and, um, and save N95s, um, you know, to until for five days until we could reuse them again, for example. Um, and so we, we have been really, really constantly, uh, you know, seeking more donations, seeking more ways to get them more quickly. We've been doing better from an inpatient perspective, but every single day is different as we start to think about opening clinics again. How are we going to have enough PPE enough to make sure that our outpatient clinics are safe and our providers are safe there. So it is a constantly evolving and dynamic need to assess every day, essentially. Um, so we may have enough right now for our inpatient side, but not enough to continue to open up the services that we would like to. And we need to calculate for our hotel motel program too, because as you saw in some of those photos, it, our staff are going out and are physically touching, evaluating um, patients in person. And so we need full PPE for those interactions as well. So thankfully we're at an okay spot now. Great. Um, and Hannah, maybe the next question can go to you too. Uh, and just remind folks too, Hannah's internet connection is not super strong, so she's keeping her video off for now. Um, so Hannah, there's a, a question uh, about you know new ways to distribute water to remote communities right now, and uh, this drives at uh, what maybe some people don't know who are listening that uh, many community members do not have running water in their homes. So often uh, there are communal collection points for water. Uh, and that is also a way in which uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a vulnerable spot for transmission, right? So maybe Hannah, you could talk to that a bit. Sure, so I think what you've mentioned is true that um, it definitely can be challenging in, in areas where there isn't access to um, piped running water. And um, in the Navajo Incident Command structure, they actually have a team that's focusing on that and um, really looking across communities, where are the communities that have that need, what's the best way to address it, not only in the short term, but also in the long term. And so I think what a lot of partners have been really giving thought to during this time and what's also related to what um, Sonny was mentioning earlier around contact tracing is that it is unfortunate that COVID is happening in this way and yet there's also really important opportunity to actually shift the system towards an equity lens where building those long-term systems whether it's public health whether it's like infrastructure whether it's even bandwidth you know for connectivity because when students were not able to be physically at school, there was a huge disparity for students that had connectivity and those that didn't have connectivity and just what that means in terms of access to education. So what's really been amazing and how Navajo Nation has been looking at this is they're looking at that bigger picture too. They're really thinking about like, what are the ways to really take this time to catalyze that system change to be able to build that infrastructure. And so they do have teams that are thinking about all of those different areas and have one specifically that's looking at 
water and access to water and the long term, but then also the short term. So I mentioned the home support and how important that is. Well, the CHRs are working really closely with the providers at the health facilities. And so whenever somebody maybe has the need to quarantine, um, assessing whenever they're doing that piece of investigation and contact tracing, what are the needs that those individuals have, you know, whether it's water, whether it's food, whether it's masks, and then making sure that they're able to receive those items. So it really is a collaboration to address what are those immediate needs, and then how can we also think about that longer term to really build some of those systems. Great, thank you, Hannah. Uh, and possibly this next question can go to both you and uh, Sonia. Maybe Sonia, if you want to take uh, the first go, but uh, an earlier question in the chat mentioned educational materials and how they're shared with patients, given that there's such vast, you know, geographic distances and connectivity issues across Navajo Nation. So how do you get that information to the right people uh, uh, during this pandemic? Uh, you know, I, I think um, probably the, the first answer that comes to my mind is every which way you can, you know, so uh, radio is an important um, medium for reaching um, the community and, um, you know, from the highest level, I know that um, leadership was actually very aggressive about putting out, um, you know, a lot of uh, radio communication as well as, you know, um, uh, live Facebook discussions from the education standpoint whenever there's an opportunity to drop anything off like whether it's a you know a food uh, pickup station um, whether it's um, you know going to a community that's heavily affected and bringing supplies out there actually if it's coming in uh, to drive through you know for testing wherever there is that moment like a touch point um, I think uh, all of us have tried very hard to um, uh, get education in in that moment whether it's you know verbally but also written materials so one thing, um, you know, that we did, um, when I say we, I mean, as Navajo Nation, um, you know, many of the practitioners realized that um, if the tests are going to take, you know, three or four days to get back, and then you have to call the person, et cetera, um, actually, what we really should be doing is like, the minute we put the swab in their nose, at that point, we should be telling them everything they need to know if their test comes back positive. And that was actually really important. I think that actually contributed to bringing the epidemic down because basically people were instituting isolation, you know, from time zero, even before they got the test back. Um, and now actually we're doing that and giving them household kits with all of the materials that they need in order to isolate at home. So those are, I think it's just been, you know, kind of, again, like any kind of tool that you can use, we've tried to use. That's great. Excellent. Um, and Hannah, did you want to add anything? It sounded... That sounded great, Sonia. <laughs> I wanted to give you an opportunity, Hannah, to add if you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, I definitely completely agree with everything that Sonia had mentioned. And then also just kind of going back to the one slide that we had with the quote from a CHR that was talking about how now's really the time to think innovatively about new ways to be able to provide information. And one of the things that um, one of our staff members who worked really closely with individuals, you know, at the hotels, as Jenny and Mia were mentioning, is that one of the things that she observed is it's so important to be able to think about how you build that rapport over the phone, which is very different, especially when you're so used to doing it in person. So there are things you have to be like more careful about, things you have to consider so that you can build that trust to be able to share information where someone's wanting to be able to ask questions and where you can also paint a picture in words where you might usually use a picture if you were there with them. So I think there are even just different ways that we're all thinking about things. And of course, there's been a lot of amazing work that's happened with being able to share information in a lot of different platforms. And then, you know, kind of evaluating that, taking a step back to see you know, where are the gaps and what are some additional ideas. So I think it's always going to be something that's ongoing, but really teaching us all a lot. And getting that feedback from community members is so, so important to really understand you know, what is working best and what are things that we can do to really improve. Thank you. Uh, this next question I want to send over to, to Jenny and Mia. Um, 
and we were chatting a little bit before the call uh, that you had some ideas. So uh, do you think this pandemic will ultimately result in long-term infrastructure improvements on Navajo Nation? Um, and maybe this is getting at the housing issues that we were discussing and other access to, to resources. Exactly. So we have really tried to, you know, think as creatively as possible about how we might be able to use FEMA and CARES Act funding for specifically for the COVID crisis, but to actually use it for, towards more long term solutions as well. So not just mm -hmm. housing people uh, temporarily in, in hotels, but actually using some of that money to be able to support permanent supportive housing options as well. So we are working with the state um, very, very closely to try to figure out how we might be able to apply for various types of grants um, through Housing and Urban Development or through CARES Act or through multiple different other areas to, to piece together to really um, uh, help us stand up one of uh, one of the hotels that we actually had called the Lexington Hotel, which was used for more permanent supportive housing. So I guess just one example of trying to, you know, um, make this last uh, and, and create more permanent solutions, which we know if we don't think about now, will just cause a, uh, another outbreak in the future. Great. And I know we're almost at time. So I have one more question for everyone and it feels like it's a common theme. Um, so maybe if, if anyone wants to jump in, go ahead. But you know, everyone listening, I'm sure wants to know, how can I best contribute? Can I be a contact tracer? Can I, do you need a health professional? Do you need PPE? What can I do? So um, maybe Sonia, you want to start, and each person just chimes in if they're if they'd like. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would take the long view. You know, I think that people right now are sort of you know surprised about um, like what's happening um, in Navajo with COVID, but actually, for people who uh, live here or work here, um, you know, this has taken centuries, you know, to 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 come to this moment and um, to, to commit and to, to, I think, support our community over the long run so that, you know, rather than bringing in um, healthcare professionals that turn over every two weeks, we can actually build that workforce ourselves, you know. So I think um, all of the support that people are providing has been tremendous um, and investing in the local community and the, the folks here on the ground to create, you know, that, that long-term capacity would probably be, in my, in my opinion, you know, the best way that that, um, that you could help. Thanks. Jenny and, and Mia, any thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think I am not as elegant of a thinker and planner as Sonia is. And I think um, I, I can only see, you know, what's in front of me. And so I think that that goal of the long term sustainable infrastructure and staffing is is the ultimate goal. And I think what we're facing is the how do we staff tomorrow and next week and and two weeks from now. And so that I think is is probably one of our more immediate challenges in terms of how do we keep up the medical oversight aspect of our hotel motel program mm -hmm. so whether that's providers nurses um, all all levels of training in terms of uh, medical personnel um, would be are needed um, and for longer periods of time so that people can really get embedded and, and learn more about the context in which they're working um, that I think is the what, what we're feeling most acutely right now but recognizing that this is not what we thought you know a couple of weeks of us all pulling you know 20 bucks out of our pocket and and putting some people up in a hotel for a little bit, that this, this is likely gonna be a need for many months, if not years. And so how do we make it something sustainable long-term? Perfect, thank you. And, and Hannah, uh, any parting thoughts too on, on that last question? I think that really covered both perspectives there. I guess the only thing <laughs> I would just add is we've always found that by really listening to the community and being guided by the community that we're always doing, you know, what is needed. And so I think that's very important to remember that those who really have the knowledge, the wisdom, the answers are community members themselves. And so by starting there, we'll always be on the right track. Perfect. Well, I want to thank each of you, Hannah and Sonia, Jenny and Mia for participating. This has been a wonderful webinar and I hope everyone listening really uh, learned something today. Uh, if you want more information about Partners in Health and COPE, please visit uh, PIH.org and COPE's website as well uh, to, to dive in deeper. You can also find us on social media, 
through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, again, thanks to everyone listening and uh, thanks for your continued support who, uh, who have chimed in today. So I uh, hope to see you all soon on this space. Have a great day.